have uh, your Bibles, we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 17. A little bit lead up to before we stand, so don't stand just yet. But if you don't have a Bible, there's a pew Bible in front of you, and the page number will be on the screen. Page number will be on the screen. But we're going to look at verse 28 before we jump into our text today. We didn't look at that last week. And so verse 28 of chapter 16 actually says this, Truly I tell you, uh, some who are standing here will not taste death, before they see the Son of Man. Now, uh, the past couple weeks, we've been looking at this question, who do you say that I am? And we looked at how Jesus uh, asked the disciples, who are people saying that I am? And they're like, man, the word on the street is you're John the Baptist or Elijah or another prophet. Or And, and, and then Jesus looks at them and says, okay, that's great, but who do you say that I am? And we've talked about how every person at some point in their life, either here on earth or somewhere in heaven, has got to answer that question. Who do you say that I am? Uh, we believe the scripture says every knee is going to bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so everybody at some point. But then he says, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, a lot of debate. What is he talking about? Is he talking about the second coming? Well, if he was talking about the second coming, we have some issues. <laughs> because I think most of the people who are hearing Jesus, the disciples, aren't with us anymore. If they are, let me know because I'd love to talk to a few of them. And... Um, that was a joke, and uh, that'd be kind of fun. And so what did Jesus say? What was he talking about? Some of the people who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Uh, uh, one that I like, and an, an idea, is, is that it, it comes from 1 John, that when John says, we have seen uh, the, the Messiah, we have seen the Son in John chapter 1, and we have beheld his glory. I, I think what John was trying to get at, that the whole book of what John is about is we start at the beginning and we get to the end. It's about the glory of God is, is, is the cross and who he is and how he's revealed as the Messiah, the Son of God. That that's real glory. And this whole upside-down kingdom is, is something different than, than anything this world can offer. And so the glory of God is seen in the cross of Jesus Christ. But then others thought, uh, which I think is why we're leading up to this next passage, is that Jesus was telling the disciples, you're going to see me in my glory. And that Jesus had in mind what was getting ready to take place, the story that we're going to look at today, where the disciples, three of them, see Jesus uh, differently than they've ever seen him before. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 17, I know we've been up and down, but if you wouldn't mind, if you're able to stand as we read God's word together, I just think it's good to respect and uh, honor God's word by standing as we read. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. After six days, Jesus took him, Peter, took with him, Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except him. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Why then did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him but have done to him everything they wish. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. This is the word of God for the people of God. And so thanks be to God. You may be seated this morning. Uh, let's pray one more time. God, we, we're going to need your help. Help us see what it is we need to see in this scripture this morning. I think there's a lot going on. I think this is big words and a big uh, event that happened for these three disciples. And I believe that it's something that, that we can learn about our own selves this morning. So God, help us as we jump in. And God, nobody needs you now more than me. And so God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you. In your name we pray these things and ask that for your glory. And we all said, Amen. So first one, or first line, after six days... This is after six days that Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, get behind me, Satan, because you don't have in mind the things of God, just the things of man. 
So six days. It's been six days since that happened. And this is really important. Now, um, you probably haven't ever wondered because maybe that's the first time you noticed that it said after six days. But, but I have wondered, so what happened during that week? What was that week like? I mean, Peter has just been told, been called Satan. So what happened during that six days? I, I think we get some idea. If you turn back to chapter 16 as well, verse 21 says this. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. I think this six days that Jesus has spent after he just told Peter, called Peter Satan, is Jesus is still trying to teach them what it means that he's the son of God. Six days of Jesus. And I also think that, guess what? It was six days of the disciples saying, you're crazy. You're crazy. That is not going to happen. Not on our watch. And so it's six days of, of Jesus saying, yeah, but this is what it means for me to be the Messiah. And they're like, no, that's not what Messiah is. That is not what that looks like for Messiah to be uh, down here on earth. And Jesus says, you know, my kingdom's different. And, and, and so six days. Of, you might even say they may have been arguing, going back and forth. He's trying to teach them. He's trying to show them. And they just weren't listening. They're probably arguing. So Jesus has been teaching. The disciples have been rebuking. Jesus has been teaching some more. And the disciples keep coming back. This is not what it means to be the Messiah. Jesus is probably thinking, man, I have about six months left before this is all going to happen. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to lose these guys. I've got to show them what this thing is all about. I've got to give them a picture, a, a, an image. Because if I don't, they may just think that I really am not sent from God and not who I say that I am. And so he took three of them, Peter, James, and John. And uh, he took them up on this high mountain. And we talked about a couple of weeks ago how, how God speaks on mountains in Sinai. God came down and gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And, and, and Elijah did battle with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Well, here, once again, God, Jesus takes three of them up on a mountain. Let's read verse 2. There, was a, there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now, as I hear this, I know you're not like me. Thank the Lord, right? But um, as I picture this, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, when you hear the word light, it's like the, the, the sky parted and light shone down. Kind of like on, um, I'm sure you've seen The Lion King. You know what I'm saying? When they walk Simba up and, and the light over the sky and like the light shines. Like, whoa. You know what I'm saying? The stars on the right. You know, and everybody's singing. And it's great. And the animals are. That's kind of what I get pictured here. But if you read the text, that's not what happened at all. This is not a light shining down on Jesus. If you read the text, it says, from inside of him, this light shone. From inside of him, from his face, and, and it made his clothes light up. He was transfigured before them. And, 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 and so what is Matthew trying to tell, this, tell us about this? Jesus is trying to give them a picture. Not of the light coming from heaven, but who he is from the inside. Uh, there's a passage in the, in, in the Sermon on the Mount that um, the light that comes from within, don't let the light coming from within get put out that it's not this light from the outside but but that when god comes inside and god shapes us and god molds us it's this transformation that happens from the inside out and so they're not seeing heaven open up and a light shining down like simba this is my son they're seeing who jesus really is from his heart and his life and it's shining forth from the inside he lights up and so the disciples, what's happening here, this is beautiful. It's almost like the curtain's being pulled back for a moment on what's really happening in God's kingdom. It's almost like the disciples get this, this intimate picture of what Jesus really is like and why he came and, and, and what this whole thing is all about. They see the heart of God. Not a light like a light show. They see the heart of who Jesus and God is and why God sent Jesus to die for they see potentially in whole what sometimes is mirrored and not seen clearly. And so Jesus invites these three up to give them a clear picture. And they see it as not this light that shines, but this inward. Oh, that's who you are. That's what it looks like. And Moses and Elijah show up. Now Peter speaks up. 
I love Peter, man. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. This is awesome. It's like church camp. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is fantastic. Let's just live here. I can't tell you how many teens. Do we have to go home? Let's just stay at church camp. It's not always like this, you know? And um, let's just stay here. We'll put up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, this word for tents is the same exact word in the Old Testament. This idea of tabernacle, this idea of, of a dwelling place. And that, that when the people were wandering around the wilderness, they had a specific tent, the tabernacle, that was in the middle of the camp where God's presence was thought to dwell. And so Peter's like, let's build tabernacle. Let's just have a place that you can just live and we'll just stay up here. and We don't have to go back down to the world. We have to go back down to the mess and all the craziness that's going on down. Let's just stay here. Now we get a picture. This is, this is such a big deal. It's so important. It's so important that the transfiguration and what's happening to Jesus with Moses and Elijah, that they don't see Jesus uh, at that moment as this otherworldly figure. They don't see Jesus as, as truly being connected in, in, in a supernatural way to God the Father. Because anytime God the Father spoke or anytime something crazy happened, people didn't talk. <laughs> they fell on their face. And so Peter's talking to Jesus just like they would have at the, at the base of the mountain. And so they see his heart and they see who he is, but they still don't have this picture that he's connected to this crazy way to the God of the universe. And I love the next verse. Oh my, you got to watch this verse five. While he was still speaking. So Peter's talking and God interrupts him. While he was still speaking. So Peter's just, oh Jesus, this will be great. And, and we can create an amusement park up here and invite people to come up and, and we'll have tents and it'll be awesome. And, and while he's still speaking, God interrupts and says this, or a bright light cloud, now the bright light from heaven, a cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to He's trying to tell you something, and you're not listening. He's trying to tell you what this whole thing is about, and you keep rebuking him. Why don't you need to shut up and listen? It's kind of like in that, that um, great Deuteronomy text, the Shema, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And the whole essence of hear, listen, it's not just, okay, I hear, but it's I act in such a way to let them know that I understand what he's asking me to do, who he's asking me to be. And so God comes in and says, this is my son whom I love. You need to listen and obey what he's asking you to do because he's my son. I'm pleased with him and what he's talking about and what I sent him to do. So don't try to thwart what this whole thing is about. Don't try to get in the way of God's kingdom moving forward because you don't like what he's saying. You need to listen to him. Quit bringing your own agenda and your own thoughts. Listen to him. I think God was pretty specific because he knew that he was going to have to get through to the disciples. They would have saw this big thing and let's stay up here. God speaks. It's awesome. And they would have continually had this idea about what God was going to do and how God was going to do it. And God says, this is my son. Listen and obey and understand that he is doing what I've called him to do. Uh, one of the guys I was reading this week, oh man, I just love this. And I thought it was really cool. Um, N.T. Wright, one of my favorite theologians. And uh, he says, well, what do we have to do? What Matthew does so beautifully for us is we need transfiguration moments. We need moments where God is just shown and we see his heart and we, and, and we want to stay there. But we, have to, we always have to keep the balance. That, that that's, that's awesome and that's what we want. We, we need those moments where God just speaks so loudly and we see his heart and who he truly is. But we have to understand the, the, the balance. Like we talked about last week, yes, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's the lion because he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And Matthew sets up beautifully the difference between the Transfiguration Mountain and Hill and the Hill of Calvary. And the, not the discrepancies, but the, the, actually the unity in what this looks like. And so um, we'll just do uh, trans, because I don't have enough room, and we'll do uh, Calvary. And so on the Mount of Transfiguration, um, Jesus is revealed in glory. 
Calvary, and on Mount Calvary, he's actually revealed, you see his heart in shame, and what it meant for him to go to the cross. Um, through the transfiguration, there's his clothes are white, Whew, shiny. Let's put that up there too. White, shiny. Uh, at Calvary, his clothes are stripped, and uh, gambling ring. Transfiguration. Uh, this is beautiful. He's flanked by Moses and Elijah. Don't do that. And um, in Calvary, two criminals. Here a bright cloud overshadows him. Transfiguration. Um, <laughs> Peter does this all the time, but Peter blurts out how wonderful it is. But at Calvary, Peter mourns the death of his Lord. What a beautiful thing! Uh, this is a really cool one. Here, when the voice of God says, "This is my Son, the Son of God," and here the pagan. So as we journey through, Jesus is saying, yes, I'm the son of God. Yes, this is all true. And yes, this is what it looks like. Uh, oh, another cool thing, Moses and Elijah. Moses gave us the law and Elijah was the prophet. I have come not to abolish the law and the prophet, but to fulfill the law. I'm trying to show you what this is all about. I'm trying to tell you I'm not anything different than what I've been telling you the whole time. And we need these moments where God's glory shines. We need those moments but only in light of who Jesus has come to be. And if it pushes us to understand the gospel differently, then we're missing the point of why we need the big moments and what God's trying to tell us in the big moments and what that looks like for all of us. And so God says, listen to him. This is great. We want to build tents here. It's awesome. We need these moments, but we have to understand that there's a world at the foot of the mountain that needs Jesus. And if we stay on the mountain, who's going to go and minister to them? If we stay up here, if we stay at church camp in St. Mary's our whole life, hey, there's people in Pauline that need to hear about Jesus too. And if I get so excited and think, oh, this is great, I become this selfish person because that's where I want to stay and that's where I'm more comfortable. And we're going to talk about this a lot next week. But we have to understand why Jesus really came and what the message of the gospel is really all about. Listen to him. Listen to him. Uh, we got to listen to him. So uh, Stephen Manley, I've been quoting him, and we don't have much time. But we don't have church tonight, so we can go to like three, and it'll be all right. Um, Stephen Manley has this quote. Uh, if you go ahead and throw it up there. Probably, this is speaking of us, probably the greatest hindrance to Christianity, uh, to the Christian life, is that we are not open to new truth at our present position. And it's tragic that we get so bagged down in comfortable routines, common patterns, and established traditions, we miss new revelation when it comes to us. It's, it's tragic that the greatest hindrance to our Christian life is just to get comfortable with everything that's going on, that God might be trying to speak something in the midst of that, and we miss it. We miss it. Because, well, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm just going to keep going through it. Man, I go to church. It's, it's really cool. Pastor plays his guitar. It's a whole lot of fun. Get the one bug in the back. Maybe God's trying to say something different to you. So how does that, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, next slide. Uh, I love this guy. I never met him, but I love him. And um, I just am, am so challenged by him the more I find out about his presidency and his life and how he lived. Um, I, I just think he led our country through maybe one of the toughest times ever. Um, so, uh, does anybody know what happened in uh, 1863? History majors? We need to go back to school. And um, Gettysburg Address. Gettysburg Address. What did she say? Okay. The Gettysburg Address. You know what's cool is we actually have a picture. Uh, go to the next picture. Uh, this is at the Gettysburg Address, and then uh, you can't really pick him out, but go to the next slide, and there's a circle around his head. And uh, that's Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln giving the Gettysburg Address. How cool is that? 
and um, and then go back to the other slide because it just is a better picture and of uh, him. And uh, so 1863, Gettysburg Address. Uh, what's the first line of Gettysburg Address? Four score, seven years ago. Um, a score is 20 is what I understand. So that would be 87 years ago. Uh, so we go back 87 years. Can I do the math really quick? I'll just do it for you. 1776. What happened in 1776? Declaration of Independence. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers signed the declaration. It's a better speech than that, but in essence, that's what it says. Now, the Gettysburg Address was controversial. We celebrate it today, but when he gave it, it was so controversial. Because in 1863, the people were living under the Constitution. I'm like, is that really that bad? I don't even know if that's how you spell it, but just pretend. And um, they were living under the Constitution. And, and the Constitution said a lot of things. But in 1863, the Constitution said that slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person. Three-fifths of a person. A slave was counted as three, not even a whole person. I don't know why they came up with the number three-fifths. But in the Constitution in 1863, uh, a, a slave was thought to be three-fifths of a person. And so what is Abraham Lincoln trying to do in the Gettysburg Address? Why was it so controversial? Because he's trying to reframe the story. He's taking them back to the very beginning of what this whole country was founded when it says all men, all men were created equal. They got so comfortable where they were. And so in his address, uh, they, they, they said that this guy got up and spoke for two hours. He wasn't even the keynote speaker before Abraham Lincoln got up and spoke. Two hours. I'm like, yes. He spoke for three minutes and said more in three minutes. Because we don't talk about that other guy's speech. So what's he trying to do? He's, he's trying to relocate their perspective. That we're living in this thought that, that a slave is three-fifths of a person. But if we're really going to be who God endowed us to be, we have to see that all men are created equal. And so in three minutes, he stirred up all this controversy because he said, we're living here, but this isn't right. It's not where we're supposed to be. This is actually what this whole country was to be about in the beginning. And so with four, five words, four score and seven years ago, he called them back. He relocated them to what the purpose of it all was supposed to be because they had gotten comfortable with where they were. Why are you telling us all this about you and me? Because I think God, if we're going to really understand who he is, may have to relocate some of us. That what Jesus, that, that everything Jesus is telling them is contrary to their traditions about what Messiah is supposed to be. It's contrary to what they think Messiah is going to be about. It's contrary to their views of what the kingdom of God is like. And they interpret all the law and the prophets in the Old Testament to their understanding of what that's going to look like. And it's not enough for Jesus just to say, come follow me. He's got to re-narrate and relocate years of school and years of training and years of learning to understand that you think this is what that passage meant. You think this is what that prophet was trying to say. This is what it really means to be a part of the kingdom. And he takes them up on this mountain and they get a picture of what he is. And all of a sudden he says, you think it's this. But if you really want to know who I am, we got to go back to what this whole thing is about to begin with. God's love for people. Not earthly reign, not earthly dominion about God's love for people and that there's something that separates God from people and we got to take care of that now and so as you read all of this other stuff you have to re like it's just this uprooting you just got to take this plant and move it over here Tara and I tried to move a bush this past week and it is dead a total relocation of, uh, of what you think and in this understanding that you're comfortable with and it's good and it's great and it works for you but maybe God's trying to say, you, I want to give you a picture for what this really could look like. And it's a scary thing. I get it. It's a scary because you may have to let go of a few things that you're just holding on to. And you may have to take on some things that you really don't think you should take on. Because God's given you a better picture of who he is. Is there anything wrong with being comfortable? No. But if it keeps you from being who God wants you to be, then there's something really wrong. 
Is there anything wrong with getting together on a Sunday morning? No, but if you think this is the point, then there's a big problem with just getting together on a Sunday morning. That's from the pastor. If this is what we think this is, and God's saying, man, I, you're just, I would love to just show you. But you may have to get uprooted and be planted new and fresh in my love and grace with what I have for you today. I want to share it with you and tell you about it. Right? Everything that Jesus is saying is contrary to everything they believe Messiah should be. And the choice is either Jesus changes or they change. And Jesus has a mission from God. He's not changing. And the same thing is true of us. Either we look at him and we rebuke him for six, seven, eight days, or a six, seven, eight years, or however long, or we look at him and say, show me, man. And if that means that I have to, to get uprooted, plant a new in the soil of your love and grace for the world, the, the understanding of who you are and what that looks like, then I'm willing to do that. Right? That's the greatest need of our hour. <laughs> we need a reproduction of the life of Jesus on the streets. We don't need a renewal and theological understanding. I mean, that's good, and I love those conversations. We don't need a better plan for church structures, although we need to do a few things around here. Our programs are quite adequate. What we need, what we need is to get to the Mount of Transfiguration and see clearly what Jesus is and who Jesus is and then plant our life right beside him and understand that, that, that the mountain's cool and that's fun, but then we got to go down to where the people are. And if I have this, 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 this understanding that is contrary to who he wants to be, then it's me that has to change. It's scary. So this isn't a theophany. This isn't a, um, a, a, a God showing up. It's more of a, this is what it means for Jesus. Verse 6, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. <laughs> You're not excited about that, but that's pretty. Um... Okay, let's, uh, let's just talk about this for a few moments, and then we'll, we'll see if we get any further. So, um, confession. I've seen the new Avengers movies twice. <laughs> and um, I went one time because my family went to Michigan and I thought they were going to see it so I went to see it by myself but then they didn't so then we went to see it together and um, I, I didn't mind it was good I mean, it was kind of embarrassing at times but there's this part in the movie spoiler alert um, there's this part in this movie where um, one of the, the bad characters at the time uh, she, she had this tele needs to I don't know you know she can mess with people's minds let's just say that and she caused all the Avengers to have fearful memories and it caused them to be defeated because fear can be very defeating. She, she, she messed with their mind and brought it back all these memories of them uh, doing things or, 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 or caused them to think that, 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 man, if I do this, this could make this happen and, and cause them to be fearful. And because they weren't allowed to live above their fear, they actually got defeated. Do you know what phrase is in the Bible maybe more than any other? Don't be afraid. Mary, the, the angel comes to Mary. Hey, Mary, don't be afraid. The angels come to the shepherds. Hey, don't be afraid. Jesus and the disciples in the boat. Don't be afraid. And Jesus right here, they're scared to death because God spoke and he touches them and he says, don't be afraid. And they look up and all they see is Jesus. How do we get beyond fear in our own life? Because Jesus is the only thing that we see. I'm focused on him and him alone. And then there's going to be crazy times. It doesn't mean that, that, that I'm not going to have moments where I want to surrender to fear. But if I let the fear cripple me, the only way is, is, is to allow to love him and to be a part of his kingdom and his glory. Does that mean that hard times won't come? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means in the midst of it, if I keep my eyes focused on him and him alone, nobody else, then in the midst of my fear, he will reach out to me and say, fear not, for I am with you. When 
we center our lives around the cross and not our own ideas, when we center our lives around who Jesus wants us to be and not, not our ideas of who Jesus should be, when we center our lives around his purpose and his plan, it could mean persecution. It could mean hard times. But the one who went to the cross for us is there with us. And when we're crippled up and we're curled up in fear, he reaches out and he says, do not be afraid. The storms aren't going to overcome you because of me. You can walk on the water because of me. I am with you. And so they started walking and coming down from the mountain and they're talking. And you notice the disciples' demeanor? They asked Jesus a question. No longer rebuking him. Ask him a question. Well, hey, Jesus, it said that Elijah's supposed to come and, and kind of set things up. He said, so what does that mean? If that's what it means, we just saw him on the mountain. Like, like what's going on? What's happening? They're listening now. They're no longer saying, hey, Jesus, this is how it's going to happen. Like, hey, Jesus, what? And Jesus told them the whole thing, and they're like, then they realized he was talking about funny how understanding happens when we listen, <laughs> as opposed to just stumbling and getting in the way. It's funny how we start to see a little bit bigger picture of what this kingdom is when we listen to who Jesus is and what he wants us to have for our lives. Hey, I love our traditions. I love them. I think they're good. But if we're not careful, we can look at people negative way because of our traditions. And what Jesus is trying to tell us is you need to relocate all of your perceptions on that cross and pick up the mantle. It's, it's painful. It's hard. Uh, I, I remember in college, just a lot of the things is kind of was being challenged and I was being pushed in, in directions I'd never been pushed before. And I remember walking around, I felt like I was walking around campus like a Listen, and we obey. What did Jesus want me to do today? Well, he said, "Do you feel free to go?" Okay, I'll do it. Let's pray. May you, Paul Nazarene, this week. May you, may you see a, a glimpse of God that is new and fresh. And when you see it, may you not say, "Hey, let's stay here." But may you actually say. I've seen of you in the cross. And as you go, may you see people the way he does and live life the way he's called you to live. Thank you, Lord. We'll see you next week.